Welcome to today's Energy Central webcast entitled, Best Practices for Demand Management Program Design. A few housekeeping notes we'd like to mention. For best results in viewing this presentation, we recommend using a wired high-speed internet connection, if, as wireless connections can be unpredictable. If you cannot get adequate sound from your computer speakers, you may dial into the audio portion using the telephone number listed in the right-hand panel of your interface under the audio section. Following the presentation, we'll have a brief question and answer period. You may submit your questions at any time using the interface on your screen. Happy to introduce today's speakers. We have with us Praveen Baggett, Vice President of Marketing at Converge, and Ania Ber Bergender, Manager, Demand Side Management, Pepco Holdings Incorporated, and David Egger, Energy Efficiency Supervisor at Gulf Power. I'm happy to turn the floor over to our first speaker, Praveen. Praveen, welcome to the event. You have the floor. Thanks, PJ, and thanks for this opportunity to share our insights about program design. Uh, what I'll be speaking to today is based on more than a decade's experience of working with utilities throughout the country. Our frontline success story is we designed and or helped facilitate programs that resulted in the recruitment and enrollment of more than 2 million demand response and energy efficiency customers across the country. The backstory, though, is those numbers couldn't have been achieved without hitting some bumps and getting some scar tissue along the way. Our hope, then, with this webinar is to help guide you away from some of those bumps so, so you avoid some of those bruises and learn a thing or two you can use yourself. A quick note on the flow of today's discussion. I'll be taking a top-down approach. Um, by that, I mean that while our experience has been with demand response, energy efficiency, and customer engagement program design, I'll be addressing broader conceptual design concerns one might apply to program design in general. So you can apply these principles in any program you're looking to launch or modify. I'll drill down some as we go along. Then Inya Berginger uh, will speak to the challenges she and we face designing and deploying the Demand Response Energy Wise Rewards Program, followed by David Egger from Gulf Power, sharing his uh, insights from structuring and implementing their dynamic pricing energy select program. We'll then have a short Q&A, where we'll answer as many questions as time allows. At the end of this session, we hope you can take away a few nuggets for the programs you may have already implemented or any you may be deploying in the future. So let's get started. You go to the next slide. Your program can be seen as having four phases, as shown here. Uh, the duration of each phase will come from either self-determined design or externally imposed deadlines. And by that I mean, for example, state regulators may impose a deadline for a percentage of load drop, something INYA uh, and PEPCO can speak to having addressed in Maryland and DC and other jurisdictions in PHI, for example. That leads us to the first phase in the four-phase approach. So if you go to the next slide, it's the planning phase. And uh, if you go to the next slide, Every strategy needs to start by identifying three things, the who, the what, and the when. Who are the stakeholders? Often a program is developed in response to new regulations based on financial, environmental, or even political realities. Utilities become the key actors. However, that said, if utilities simply focus on compliance and accommodating regulatory authorities, they risk running afoul of their existing customers. Uh, therefore, it's imperative to keep the focus on customer centricity as you work on any program design. But this can be f taken even further. Um, in the new paradigm of competitive deregulated markets, utilities would be advised to see new programs for their marketing potential to more fully engage with their customers. So this is really an opportunity to build customer loyalty and goodwill. If you click next, so what are the goals? Primary goals should be clearly defined and achievable. These goals could be enrollments, um, energy load, cost savings, customer participation, um, 
Additionally, your secondary goals should also be viewed as opportunities to build your brand, customer satisfaction, and develop cross-marketing with other programs if possible. Um, we realize sometimes cross-marketing is not allowed. Some utilities can finesse that, however. When must the goals be achieved? Are, are they internally or externally imposed? Are they hard deadlines or soft targets that allow to catch up later on? The strategy must fit a timeline. So at Converge, we dig deeper, and I'll quickly run through some of the technical considerations we look at. So if you click Next, if you see on this right-hand side um, of the slide, we'll start, I'll talk about a, a few key elements here. We'll start at the top, um, the playing field. Is the market regulated or deregulated? Market competition changes the dynamics and dictates differences in approach. A deregulated market has customers that are more discriminating, requiring a more refined approach in program design and execution. Take, for example, the ERCOT energy market in Texas. There are lots of retailers there. There's fatigue in the market. The customers have been touched by hundreds of retailers. This is an important consideration as you are constructing an offer for, for that market. Let's talk about AMI, uh, the footprint. Um, has AMI been implemented? If so, an AMI market offers opportunities for a data-driven, customer-centric approach. Besides telling us something about the market landscape, it also affects communication options. Let's talk about equipment. Uh, for demand side management, there could be an outdoor switch or smart thermostat. If there is AMI, there could be dynamic pricing, time of use, peak time rebate, and so on. Operational elements and technology are obviously major components of any design and need to be woven in. Next, consider the potential market penetration. Size the opportunity. How many customers actually qualify for the offer? Dig deeper in analyzing the data that, as a utility, you already have about customers' usage and such. Sometimes the opportunity may be smaller and more restricted than first thought. The degree of customer familiarity how much communication has already taken place. At the start, there will be a need for more customer education. Later on, in a more mature market, it likely means more focus on structuring customer benefits or, in fact, restructuring the entire value proposition. Um, customer base. Here we know we need to know the audience, um, the demographic, psychographic, um, home construction, usage data, um, our approach and program design will be different in, say, Little Rock, Arkansas versus the D.C. market where there are a lot of apartments and a different demographic. The more you know your customers, the better you can micro-target your messaging. Finally, the program life cycle. Are you initiating a design or is it a redesign? If it is a redesign, it may mean working against customers' preconceived notions and false expectations in some cases. Or it could be that we are seeking further penetration into an already saturated market. Very different from initiating a new program. Let's go to the next slide. It's about program development phase. So as part of this phase, if you go to the next slide, as part of this phase, we explore the offer concept. We have drawn our insights from the planning phase that we just discussed. Now we bring together our analysis of the components and hone in on the customer experience. What do they want? How will they experience the program? How will they experience the offer? Let's face it, while most folks feel some social responsibility and want to do what's right for general good, everyone wants to save money. That said, what we offer in our programs don't tend to be on anyone's Christmas wish list. Our customers do not wake up one day and say, you know what, I need to improve my utilities grid reliability, and I should be on the utilities DR program. We have to design programs that create interest and demand and also ensure that there is stickiness. So how do you take something that's technical, tech-focused, often complex, with rules that require commitment, effort, maybe inconvenience, and make it into something easy to understand, comfortable, and ultimately desirable. 
that's the challenge. And we do realize that there are the realities of the rim test and TRC and costs need to be realized. But the offer design should include sweeteners or incentives for the customers. Let's go to the next slide. Next is the implementation phase. So if you go to the next slide, now we are ready to put your plan into action. This is where the rubber meets the road. So the question is, if you build it, will they come? There are many utilities that have developed programs that have achieved middling level success in terms of market acceptance, often poor program design or not following the best practices for recruitment are the cause for marginal performance. We'd like to share with you five best practices that we have identified. The first one is analysis. Know who you're trying to target and when. Analyzing the data and performing segmentation helps fine-tune targeting. Also, logistically, if installs are required, you want to time your enrollments to your ability to timely fulfill them. It may mean a phased rollout, but all this is part of the analytical aspect um, of the best practice. Offer choice. Um, on the demand response side, we try to offer customers a choice of technology and cycling options, two or three. Too many choices can overwhelm customers and increase complexity. Customers become more invested when they feel they have exercised control in their decision. Next is channels. So many ways to reach your customers. There's direct mail, when retail, email, bill and search, radio, TV, outbound telemarketing, door-to-door, -door, online, social media, and the list goes on and on. Um, each can be effective. Each may reach a different demographic. Each has a different cost. So be selective and timely. Also, we need to realize that certain channels are more appropriate for launch, others more suitable for deeper market penetration. Um, education, um, that means openness, comprehensiveness, simplification, while avoiding oversimplification and setting appropriate expectations. If you oversell it, you'll disappoint creating ill will and costing you trust. So if the customer may experience some negative impact from your program, be upfront and honest. Um, this is the age of transparency. And finally, partnerships. Building relationships with key stakeholders and regulators. This is an important best practice and may seem out of place at this point, but our experience has been that forward-thinking utilities invest time and energy in cultivating collaborative relationships that they can rely on when they hit speed bumps along the way. If you go to the next slide, the right DRMS, the Demand Response Management System, is key, the software that holds the program together. There are a lot of moving parts. And essentially, it Having gone through so many years of deployment, we have come to a counterintuitive con conclusion. A multi-vendor approach increases risk. The confusion occurs when utilities try to put their eggs in many baskets. A vendor for call center, another one for marketing, one for installation, software from somebody else. Um, Converge has taken over several programs where a multi-vendor approach was the culprit in eroding program effectiveness. We go to the next slide. It's the final phase, the evaluation phase. Um, and if you go to the next slide, we need to establish clear MNV process and procedures up front. This prevents need to tinker with program design in the middle of the implementation phase. For example, if incorrect assumptions for the kilowatt factor are used. This leads to program over or under delivering, requiring tinkering with cycling strategies mid-season, impacts customers. All this can be avoided with proper planning and procedures up front. So review your metrics, maintain a strong documentation, and also build flexibility into the program design. You'll need to hear from stakeholders what's working and what isn't. Maybe your call center gives you reports, maybe you get comments on social media site, maybe your sales force or installers offer written reports, all those need to be 
part of the evaluation phase that enable you to then make um, changes down the road. Next slide, please. Um, that's just a summary slide that we have included uh, with all the key points there. Uh, if you go to the next slide, which is my final slide, so I think what I want to say here is that certainly having an experienced driver who knows where the bumps might be can be a big help in guiding your design. But if you know your footprint and your customers and you're thorough in covering all the phases laid out here today, you'll be better prepared for when those bumps will come and what you need to do to steer your program to great success. With that, let me turn this over to our partner in design, Inia Bergenger. Thanks. Good. Thanks very much, Praveen. And thank you to all of you who are on the call today. We appreciate you taking time to listen to some of the hard-earned lessons that uh, we have learned over the years, um, as Praveen uh, mentioned. Next slide, please. Uh, if anyone on this call is, is new to demand response, we found that this graphic is, is very helpful in explaining what it's all about. Primarily, we're um, offering customers our opportunity or enlisting their help in reducing overall peak energy demand um, during peak usage times, primarily uh, depending on the time of the, uh, where you live in the country. And sometimes your peak is in the middle of the summer when all the air conditioners are going. In other parts of the country, it's um, in the middle of the winter when you have a lot of electric heating out there. But in any event, these programs have been around for decades and decades, although over the last number of years they have evolved significantly. Next slide, please. A little bit of information about Pepco Holdings. Um, we serve approximately 5.6 million customers in the District of Columbia, Maryland, Delaware, and New Jersey under three different operating companies, Atlantic City Electric, Delmarva Power, and Pepco. You see there on the map where they all are located. Um, and we also have a non-regulated subsidiary that provides energy efficiency and renewable energy services under the brand name of Pepco Energy Services. And yes, we are currently under um, a transition to Exelon that we hope will um, be part of the Exelon family of companies mid-year this year. Next slide, please. So there, Pepco, Pepco Holdings offers a very wide range of um, energy saving programs for, com for customers. Uh, there's a very long list of energy efficiency programs and also uh, a quite long list of demand management programs, which we're going to talk about here today. The main types of demand management programs that we offer are the direct load control. We offer only through air conditioning direct load control, although many uh, utilities also offer water heater and farm equipment and other sorts of direct load control programs. Um, and we offer interruptible rate programs. We offer a peak time rebate program, which is enabled through AMI dynamic pricing. And we offer, uh, we're piloting right now, an EV charging time of use um, pilot. So we're anxious to see how that turns out. Next slide, please. So to guide this morning's discussion, I wanted to kind of follow um, an interactional behavior theory that I like to call forming, storming, norming. Um, and that's not just a play on words, but it really is, is very functional in helping to understand the cycles that you're going to experience as, as you go through um, designing and implementing any demand response program or pretty much really any program. Next slide, please. The first stage, um, as um, Praveen talked about, is, is our planning and research phases. And I'm calling this the forming um, portion of this. Really, why are you coming together to offer these programs? What are your goals? What are you trying to achieve? Have you had legislative or, or regulatory mandates given to you? Such as, for example, in um, the state of Maryland, there's legislative um, mandates out there that the entire state is, is to reduce energy consumption by 15% by the year 2015 compared to a 2008 baseline. So we have many programs in place in Maryland to help achieve that, and I will tell you that we're meeting those targets, which we're very, very proud about. Um, if so, if your goal is, is to um, achieve megawatt savings or emission reductions or to um, achieve specific deadlines, then you have to take a top-down approach and say, basically, what is it going to take to make that requirement? And sometimes there's very, very, very stringent things that you have to put in place to um, achieve some very aggressive goals. 
If your, if your primary goals are to achieve business reasons, such as to participate in the capacity market, to simply lower your peaking energy supply costs, um, to avoid transmission or distribution upgrades in the future, um, then your goal really is, is uh, whatever megawatt commitments um, that you can make or to reduce those costs. And you want to take a bottom-up design approach. What can you realistically accomplish, and what can you uh, what, what can you really do, which will help uh, set your goals for you? And the one thing I want to really emphasize is, is you need to research, research, research. Uh, Praveen mentioned that it's true, um, especially among people who have been in the utility business for a long time. There's a tendency to say, "Oh, we got this." Well, you know what? The market is changing so fast, and there is so much information out there and so many options out there today, really. You really want to study the best practices that others have employed. You want to monitor industry news. Webinars such as this are very helpful. There are many, many, many other ways that you can um, learn what's going on. You really need to monitor the current codes and the standards that are out there, because they change all the time. Um, really want to understand what your partner or your contractors offer. We've learned a lot over the years um, from talking with Converge and our other partners um, about what can we reasonably do to achieve the goals that we have. And you also want to understand what your likely costs are. Um, none of this is free, none of it's cheap, um, but in the end of the day, it all costs a lot less than building additional capacity out there in the market. Next slide, please. So the next phase is, is we're entering into the storming phase. And this is a program design and launch phases. And I call this storming because there is no way that what you initially think um, that you're going to do is going to end up being what you actually implement. So we have to understand which changes in the customer's energy uses patterns are they going to actually adopt and that will help us meet our goals. If your goal is, is to participate in the capacity markets, you need to implement some sort of programs that are going to reduce consumption only occasionally, and that when needed. For example, um, we participate in PJM, it's our RTO, so we need to, um, and we do participate in the capacity market, and we need to be able to implement to be, to be um, uh, facile enough to implement these programs when needed. Um, or when PJM calls an emergency event. We have to be able to react very quickly for that. So what we have put in place to um, respond to these is, is direct load control. We've had that in place for many, many years under different um, programs. We have interruptible rates. Um, you, we know the AMI interval data enabled dynamic pricing programs, such as peak time rebate, rebates, real time pricing, um, and other things that the new smart meters enable for us. If you're looking to lower your peaking or supply rates, um, then programs that reduce peak consumption at consistent times will be what you want to explore. Time of use rates, peak time pricing, interruptible rates, behavioral programs, such as uh, the reports are very popular out there these days. We're piloting an in-home display right now that pushes out um, usage, their own personal inter, uh, usage information so that they can um, make choices. Maybe it's time to reduce my consumption right now. Um, we also have a lot of solar distributed generation um, on, our, on our grid. Um, that we also implement conservation voltage reduction. So there are many, many, many programs that you can consider if your goal is, is to just lower your peaking um, or supply rates. Next slide. Another phase, uh, continuing on with the program design and launch phases, um, so which programs are really going to be best for your customers? Uh, there are, you need to consider them for all of your, all of your customer groups. Residential, um, there are different programs that are going to be appealing to single family residents, uh, multifamily such as apartments or condos. There are a lot of multimetered um, uh, um, multi-metered apartment complexes out there. I happen to live in an old building in Washington, D.C. that was built in 1929, and they never converted to individual meters in each unit. It's a wonderful building, but we all share just one electric meter for the building. But nevertheless, I own my home, so um, we, we need to do something that appeals to all of the residents in the building, even though nobody pays their, their electric bill directly. 
You need to design programs that are specific to businesses. What's going to not interrupt a business's um, basic time when they need to make certain that their customers are comfortable? Um, there's a different model that's going to appeal to industrial customers. And um, most of us live in a region where there's some sort of government, whether central, whether um, municipal or state. Um, it happens to be that our region also services the federal government. So there are very specific programs that are targeted to um, these different kinds of customers. What is going to incentivize customer participation? Are they going to want additional money? Is it credits off their bill? Um, who is interested in helping the environment more? Who wants cool gadgets? Um, who wants to compete with their neighbors? All of these programs are, have been successful in um, helping our customers to reduce their consumption. Do we want to offer them a control itself? Do they want to control it themselves? Um, do they want automatic direct load control? Do they want both? Which are going to incentivize them to reduce their uh, energy use? What is your funding source? Some of our programs are funded through a surcharge on customers' bills. Some are not. We recoup the, the investment through base rates. Um, and sometimes those costs are not recouped during base rates or through a surcharge, and so our shareholders have to own the cost. If you're in a cooperative, um, the, your members would have to shoulder those costs. So all of that has to go into consideration. Um, what is your approval process? We are in a highly regulated environment, and so our approval process is very long. It takes at least six months or a year to get a program approved. Um, so keep all that in mind when you're um, designing your program. When, you will, when will you actually be able to start um, achieving the benefits that your program is intended to do? Uh, sometimes it takes a while for your board of directors to approve a program, especially if it's a new concept. You know, you might need to go back in a couple of times and, and explain what, what this is all about and why, um, why they will benefit from that. And then the question is, is to market or not to market? Uh, there is no question. As Praveen said, these programs are not, and if you build it, they will come. This is behavior change 101, and you have to um, you have to let your customers know how they're going to benefit from this. I could actually do a whole webinar. In fact, I have many times on successful um, engagement, successful marketing into these programs, but I know that that's not the topic today. I will just say that you will be shooting yourselves in the foot if you don't include marketing costs and a really strong marketing customer recruitment plan in whatever you um, design and for your launch phase. Next slide, please. So you you also have to put your you have to plan your budgets up front, and the costs are again um, substantial for a program. You have to include all of your equipment costs, any labor if you're going to have equipment installed. Um, believe it or not, folks who install devices want to get paid. Um, marketing and advertising costs a lot. It's worth the investment. Um, we have achieved um, more than 50% customer participation in one of our service territories because we have had very aggressive marketing and customer recruitment programs out there. And I will tell you that that's very successful. The average um, in the US is 13% participation, so we're very proud of that, um, that participation rate. You have to pay for the educational uh, literature. If you're installing thermostats, for example, in customers' homes, you need to print um, manuals on how they can run those, how they can operate those thermostats. Um, you have to include costs for your in-staff time. If you have an outsourced program manager, such as we do, we manage, we have hired Converge to manage these programs for us. Um, we need to pay them to do their work. Um, we also do offer customer incentives in most of our programs as they have been approved by our various commissions. Um, and we find that that actually does generate better participation when we uh, reward customers every year for participating in the program. So really you want to add up all of the benefits of the programs, such as avoided energy costs, um, factoring out line losses. You want to um, quantify your capacity market revenues. Uh, your energy market revenues if you participate in those. You want to um, calculate your societal cost benefits. There are tables for all of that um, to determine all of your benefits. And then divide by that all of these costs that we just mentioned, equipment costs, including maintenance costs down the road, 
labor, marketing and advertising um, for all your program materials, your management fees, um, customer incentives. And if you can divide um, your benefits by the cost and come up with a total resource cost of greater than one, then you're doing really well. Pardon me. Uh, so the object is, is to have a total cost resource of greater than one, and if you have done that, then the cost, then the program will be worth running, and you should implement it. Overall, we want to be good stewards of our customers' dollars. Um, we know that they're no longer rate payers, um, but they are now customers, and we want to treat them as such. Be certain that in your design phase, you include staff training. Um, it's, I just cringe when maybe a new call center representative isn't familiar with our program yet, and a customer calls in to, uh, with a question and the CSR doesn't know. So be sure and invest in internal training time um, for everyone. Um, plan your rollout, and then roll out your plan. Um, really, spend the time to plan substantially upfront, and it will pay off in spades as you're implementing your program. Next slide. So once you've focused, once you've settled on um, all of that storm, all of those storming activities, you've gone through all of your planning and your launching, um, and you're seeing all of those activities take place. In the implementation phase, you really reach a kind of a normed stage to where if you've enlisted the right partners. Um, who are knowledgeable, experienced, and willing to fix issues quickly, um, and you stay involved with the program, you will reach that normative stage fairly quickly to where you can just continue to roll out and continue to achieve your goals. You have to have far-sighted vision. Um, most of these programs are amortized over many, many years, and so you need to um, know that it's not going to happen in a year or even two years or five years. Um, you have to have a long-term approach to it all. Keep sufficient inventory, uh, inventory on hand. Um, we Sometimes we're just very, very, very pleased with how quickly the installation is going, and it takes a long time to get the um, equipment in place, so don't let yourselves run short. Um, maintain sufficient field staff to do all the work that's needed, and that usually means maintaining a pipeline of people that you can pull on if people decide that they want to move on to other jobs for whatever reason. You really do want to engage strategic advertising and marketing firms to help you. Again, I've been in this business for 30 years, and I know marketing and advertising inside and out. But nevertheless, um, it's still I get in fantastic insights from our partners who have also seen best practices in other places. So we also want to interact smoothly with other programs. As I mentioned, PHI offers a number of other energy savings programs, and we would really like to um, take advantage of customers who have participated in another program, for example, so that we can go back and um, say, hey, here's another opportunity for you to save energy and to save money. Um, would you like to participate? So again, execute your rollout plan, but be flexible for surprises. It's surprising um, things that can come and derail even the best laid plans. So just be aware and be flexible. Um, stay involved with all of your partners so that you can adjust as needed. Um, so after you're in that norming stage, surely something is going to come along that is going to cause another storming phase. Those surprises, those nasty little surprises, um, it could be that uh, a law changes that makes the capacity market no longer as um, profitable as it was before. Those of us who are served under PJM know what I'm talking about and probably other RTOs as well. Um, or there may be something in the community that um, has really affected negatively customer perceptions. Um, maybe your customers are rejecting the offer. Um, could be in our region, we know that in PEPCO we have research that says that 25% of our customers are just not going to um, participate in any utility programs no matter what. Or maybe they're afraid of Big Brother controlling their thermostat. So um, be very, very, very careful. There's a program called, we call the Master Meter Account Program that I'm going to highlight here in a moment that customers have rejected our offer. Um, and so we've had to go back to the drawing board a couple times. But also, be, a, be aware and adjust to competing services that are entered the market. 
it used to be that um, the utilities are really the only ways that customers could get a really great programmable thermostat. Well, now they can go to their big box store and buy one and install it themselves. Or there are a lot of Wi-Fi devices that are coming onto the market now that are very, very popular, whereas um, traditionally the direct load control devices were radio controlled. There's a lot of home energy management services that are offered by cable companies, by private companies. All of that is, um, is now entering into competitive world with the traditional direct load control programs. Um, what are changes in regulatory environments? Um, changes in capacity market rules. Cybersecurity is, is a reality now, and we all have to be very aware of anything that any bad actors there could enter um, into the electric grid through smart, through smart devices. Next uh, slide, please. So as you weather those storms and you adjust your programs um, accordingly, and that's no small task. I'm not here to gloss over you know, all the steps that go into that. But just in the interest of time today, uh, you will get back to the forming. Uh, you have to reform your programs at that stage. Do you need to just make minor adjustments, or do you really need to go back to the drawing board and kind of start all over? We have two examples um, in our Pepco Maryland residential program, which we have very aggressive targets um, in that. Um, but we have, over the years, been able to make just minor adjustments in the program, primarily in our marketing approach. Um, direct a mail worked very well in the first year or so, but then that trickled off, and we were able to bring in door-to-door -door recruitments, and we have achieved very significant results. Um, this is the program where we have almost 60% um, participation of our eligible customers because we have been flexible and adjusted our marketing approach over time, um, and the customers continue to engage um, with us in this program. We have, though, had another program called our Master Metered Account Program um, that we have had to go back to the drawing board a number of times. Um, customers were simply not signing up. It was a very complicated program. There were too many requirements for the customers uh, to have to do. So we went back to our commission, I believe, four times over the last three or four years in order to adjust the program. And each time our commission agreed with us and um, saw what we were trying to accomplish and facilitated and approved our request. Um, but still, we had insufficient participation, and so we try again with a different program design based on research, um, and still, we did not have sufficient participation to warrant all of the costs that were involved in implementing this program. And finally, in the end of 2014, our commission has discontinued this program. So even though the, the idea was good, we were trying to reach a good target audience, in the end of the day, it was simply not a viable program um, and many others out there were much more viable and are better meeting our goals. So nevertheless, we still want to maintain positive relationships with these customers, so we are referring these participants to other energy efficiency um, and other demand response programs. So now that we're making those adjustments to these programs, we get back to the norming stage and get back to implementation phase in all of our other programs. But there's no, we do not have any, um, any thought that no more storms are going to break in the future. We're prepared to um, react quickly as we need to for any of the storms that come up and then um, work with those and get back to a norming stage eventually, too. So that was that next slide, please. That was really it for my prepared remarks today. I'm going to go ahead and pass it on over to David Eggert. Thank you, Inia um, and uh, Praveen. Y'all both have brought up some very good points, and I think as everybody can see, there's there's a lot that goes into this. There's a lot of information to crunch, um, a lot of detail to consider. And with that said, I'm going to focus in on a couple of things that we found to to help us be successful through the years, and that's consistency and customer focus. Um, you know. I don't think it's good to, to be jerking your customers around a lot with, with different messages that don't jive or coincide with um, something that they've heard previously from us. So we tried to, um, to, to really stay consistent in that. And, and, and in that, I wanted to address specifically the, the, the um, marketing campaigns you see on this first slide. Uh, we focused on three things there. The first one talks about comfort. Um, 
The next one with the little boy swimming talks about lower prices. And then finally, the energy coach says the name of the game is savings. And those are the things or the, the messages or the hooks, if you will, that are going to grab customers' attention and try to get them interested in what your, what your goals are and then um, getting their participation. Next slide, please. Now, we've been doing this an awful long time, and um, as you can see, the, the program itself was initiated in 2000. We actually started uh, research into this concept much, much earlier than that in the, the late 80s, early 90s. And um, the goals that we established during that time were to reduce peak demand reduction, uh, enhance existing generation, and then see what we could do to uh, improve customer value. Because again, it's, your customers are so important and you have to maintain uh, a focus on them. And then one thing there up above, you see where it says that it's an automated TOU CPP program. Well, one of the keys to making all this work is the automation. Because we've heard, you know, and we know that, that some utilities have had you know, some success with thermostat program, program with thermostat programs and others, you know, marginally with smart meters. But really those two things kind of, they're independent of one another. Um, you know, there has to be some ability for customers to react and respond if you're ever going to get, you know, the full benefits or maximize your benefits out of the program. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, there's several components that go into the program itself. You've got the thermostat and the devices. You've got uh, a web portal. You've got the, the meter reading or the AMI side of this. But one of the key components is and always will be uh, good rate design. And, and I really can't overstress the importance of having good rate design and having a successful program because this is what really is going to help your customers save money. Now, we don't provide incentives to customers for participating. The incentive that they receive comes every month when they get their bill. Um, you know, they see their incentive through energy savings. Now, the rate itself, there are three, um, three things I want to focus on there. It's, it's a simple format. Really, what you're talking about for the most part is a low, a medium, and a high pricing tier. Um, the critical is that peak demand reduction uh, element, and, and we, we really rarely use that because you, you don't have that many peak hours during the year that um, you're going to have to invoke something like this. So, you know, the majority of the time customers are going to be chugging along with a, a low, uh, medium, and a high uh, pricing tier to, to basically uh, digest. And we think that with it being simple, I mean, obviously it looks like a schedule. Um, People are familiar with schedules. They know how to deal with schedules, so we're tying in on that. The low, medium, and high makes sense because we're used to seeing things like that. And it's consistent. It doesn't change, you know, every other day or every week or anything like that. We have a summer and a winter pricing period, and that's the only time that the rate period itself changes. Um, so customers can easily adapt to, you know, uh, exactly how they need to respond uh, should they choose to respond and maximizing their benefits from the program. Now, in the, the pie chart that you see, if you look at the, the low and medium price periods, you'll see that 87% of the time a customer is purchasing electricity at a price that's lower than the standard residential rate. So there's where they have the real opportunity to, to save uh, on their energy purchases. We get a benefit of them reducing their consumption during the high price period, and um, you know we can. It's, what's interesting is you can look at a load shape and see how or at what time the load, the price has changed just by the customer reaction. You wouldn't even have to put the hours of the day in there. You can see when the price has changed. So this provides customers with a very real opportunity to save. Next slide, please. Okay, another one of the key components is the, uh, are the devices themselves. You have equipment that enables customers to pre-program devices and automatically respond to the variable prices that you just saw. Um, the two major consumers in your home, or the three major consumers in your home are your HVAC system, your water heater, 
uh, electric water heater in your pool if you have a pool. And these devices, again, are, are pre-programmed so that they'll respond to the way that customers want them to respond if they're not around and, and can adjust their thermostat, or they can go online and make changes as they want to because we've got a, an easy to use and understand web programming portal that uh, we've gotten very good feedback on. In the early days of this, all the, the programming was done at the thermostat, and understandably, we got a lot of complaints about um, the difficulty to see the numbers, to follow through a sequence, you know, a lot of things like that. So um, the ability to go and, and utilize technology through a web portal was very, very important to us. And another thing that we see coming in the future is going to be um, mobile functionality. You know, everybody's wanting to do everything on their phone now, and we think energy users are going to be no different. But one of the things that makes this a key component is that, you know, it enables conservation savings. Um, you saw the rate savings that you get, but by programming your usage better, you're actually avoiding usage in the home so because you've got a programmable thermostat. You've got a timer on your water heater, so you're going to use less energy overall, and that's savings that you're going to see as well. Next slide, please. Okay, I talked right up front a little bit about constants or consistency. Well, um, we talked about goals. And the goals that I uh, mentioned earlier for the pilot, well, they're the same things that we focus on today. And by doing that, we've been consistent, and I think that it kind of shows that, that we chose the right things those many years ago to focus on to, to provide us with uh, not only an effective program for us, but a customer-pleasing program as well. Customer focus. You know, Praveen hit on this earlier, but Without customer engagement or customer, participa customer participation, you don't have a program. So no matter what we can do to impact or potentially impact or design our program around our goals, if we make it such that it's difficult or unwielding for customers to participate or they don't see uh, a good enough value equation in it, then they're not going to participate. And you know, that's not a good thing because, again, that's that'll um, – basically be the death knell to the program itself. Change. You know, I've, I've heard it said before that the only real change is, uh, the only real constant is change. And that is so true. We've gone through many iterations of um, equipment, and you see technology changing significantly. So, um, you know, you just basically accept it as a, as a part of everyday life. And then in terms of looking ahead, we're constantly looking ahead, and we're in a constant state of reinvention of the program because, you know, we not only have to stay up with customers, but because of a lot of the time that it takes to get to market, you've really got to be anticipating a lot of things and be ready, you know, when um, technology changes or behavior changes make it um, necessary to, to really redesign your program. Next slide, please. Some of the variables. Well, we talked about technology. We went from the, the equipment used in the pilot to a, to a main gate home system to a broadband system with Zigbee, and, and our next generation that's going to be launching in about a year is the broadband system with a, a Wi-Fi portal. So, um, or excuse me, Wi-Fi enabled communication within the home. So, you know, you've you've seen those changes in technology, and then. Um, Again, I mentioned earlier, we've gone from programming at the thermostat to programming on a portal. Um, we've made a couple of changes with rates. Again, paying attention to what customers have told us and then trying to uh, adapt accordingly. One of the things that we experienced early on around the 2001-2002 time frame was that our customers were telling us that the high price period in the summer was too long. Um, it was from 11 a.m. to 8 p.m. on weekdays summer weekdays. And so what we did, we went to the commission, we petitioned to have that changed, and the high price period now is from 1 p.m. to 6 p.m., and customers like that much better. Uh, another thing that we were able to do because of that change was we had, if a customer went off the program and then wanted to, um, to have the equipment installed later, there was a reinstallation fee that we charged. And part of that was because the savings at that time were significantly different between summer and winter and we didn't want customers to game the system. 
and then incur, make us incur a lot of costs. So we, we put that on there as kind of a preventive mode, but with the change in the hours, that wasn't necessary anymore. We used to have a participation fee, but again, we dropped that because we felt like it was, it was um, acceptable, yet in some cases it was hindering uh, participation. With regard to competitors, I know that we often look at the, the gas utility or another electric utility as being our competitors, but really when you get down to it in a program like this, what you're, try, what you're really competing with is the, the family time or the family budget. You know, if, if mom or dad has to take the little ones to Little League practice or dance or go grow groceries or cook supper or anything like that, the last thing they want to deal with is what the price for electricity is going to be tomorrow. And by making it simple and consistent and giving them the automating tools to, to manage their use better, they can actually go in and do a lot of this um, much, much easier, and um, it helps them to achieve their own goals. Next slide, please. So what do our customers say about the program? Well, in our most recent survey that was just completed, we're at 90, well, 89 percent satisfied with 81 percent very satisfied. Uh, those results are consistent from the pilot on forward. Uh, and I think, again, it's a tribute to, to focusing on customers and providing customer value. With regard to marketing or how we actually go out and solicit customers, you know, we tried a lot of different things, but what's been su successful or provided the most success for us through the years is direct mail. And that accounts for 60% of our enrollees. It's, it's kind of boring in one sense, but it's effective. And another benefit to it is that if you look at a lot of other marketing channels, this tends to be less costly. So we've got the benefit of that. Um, another one, which is actually the second most effective means of recruitment, is referrals. And that doesn't cost us anything. And I think everybody seeks for some type of, of program or hook where customers tell other customers they need to participate in that. And obviously, customer recruitment on that is zero dollars, and that's just doesn't get any better than that. And another interesting thing is that the the number third reason the number third the third reason that customers cite as um, as participating in the program comes from our former customers who decide, yeah, I tried this, I didn't like it like I thought I would. They get off the program, and we have a very large number of those that say, you know, that was actually a lot better than I realized at the time. I was saving more, and I wanted to get back on the program. So you're talking about three channels right there that are pretty uh, inexpensive for us from a marketing standpoint to be able to, to recruit. So in closing, I just want to say that, um, you know, you, you look for consistency of message, you look for customer focus, you take advantage of the technology, you take advantage of the changes as opposed to constantly resisting changes, and you, you, you look for opportunities to make those things work to your advantage. And with that, I'm going to get it, give it back to Praveen. Thanks, David. Uh, that was great. In fact, I want to thank both uh, David and Inya for their excellent insights. Um, at this point, I think um, let me um, go through some of the questions that we have received, and we have received a lot. And I think uh, we may not be able to get to all of them. But uh, let's start with um, this question that um, I think, Inya, you would be um, I direct that to you. Um, do you reward customers when they enroll in the program or after the fact on per event basis? Uh, well, yes and kind of. <laughs> we do offer uh, what we call an installation bonus. We do reward customers um, between 30 and uh, I think it's between 30 and um, $50, depending on the cycling level that they choose, when the device is installed, not when they enroll, because many customers enroll but then for whatever reason don't actually proceed to um, participate in the program. So we offer the installation bonus when they get installed, and then we don't incentivize per event, but we per incentivize per summer. And we have, again, a stated rate for the entire summer, which we prorate out as bill credits um, over the summer, June through October. 
Great. Thanks, Anya. And I think the next question, I think I'll uh, ask uh, David and Anya, you may want to chime in after that. Uh, when you give customers data about their energy use, can or do you include information about real-time generation profile in addition to cost? No, we don't. Um, the one thing that, that we try to focus in on in training our customers or educating our customers might be a better word, is that, you know, really what we're talking about is, is weather sensitive demand. And, and customers obviously understand weather and weather patterns. And the, the system is designed so that customers can respond accordingly. Um, you can do some things like that, and, and there's a certain percentage of the market that would really be interesting and get it, interested in getting that information. But I think it's a small percentage of the market and what our concern is that in providing that, providing that information, we're going to create, excuse me, create a lot of confusion for those that don't understand it. So we've tried to avoid that. Great. And I will say that. Yeah, do you want to? Yeah. Oh yeah, sorry, Praveen. Um, we actually do provide the energy use data all the time. Um, we make it available on customers' My Account page where they go to pay their bills um, on our utility portal. We, um, because of the AMI data, we make those profiles available to customers all the time, and we do want them to go in and get familiar um, with their energy usage patterns. Um, and in fact, we're coming out with an advertising campaign um, here very shortly that encourages customers to go use those energy tools um, on our My Account page. Okay, and if I can, I'd like to um, supplement my answer to the last question, too. The question was, is do we also compensate per event? For our direct load control program, no. We do compensate only per the, for the summer's use, a stated a standard fee for the summer. We have rolled out a dynamic pricing program, a critical peak pricing program, um, two years ago in a couple of our jurisdictions. And there, customers are compensated only in the amount of energy that they reduce per event. Uh, uh, Praveen, if I could thanks, say yeah. one thing yeah. as well. Sure. I, I thought the question referred to just providing, excuse me, generation information. We do as well provide information on customer usage. But like I said, I thought right. the question was, do we provide generation information? And no, we do not. Nope. We got up. Thanks, though, David, on that. Um, I think we have, there's one other question, and that's, um, let me take that. Um, and the question is, we are constrained by the TRC and RIM tests imposed upon us, and our program design has to work within the constraints imposed by these uh, uh, tests. Um, great question. It's actually fairly broad, and let me say, you know, just a couple of points on that. First of all, different states have different methodologies and priority assigned to either a TRC or a RIM test. If your TRC or RIM tests are negative, this is a good indicator to dig deeper um, and question if the methodology needs to be looked at. I mean, it is true that for the vast majority of states, it is, um, it's a fact that demand response, for example, or energy efficiency are great solutions and tests are positive. So a negative test possibly implies that maybe duration, um, length of the assets not you know, being considered long enough. There could be a variety of reasons why, um, you know, such as low capacity uh, value in, in the market that's causing that. Um, the other consideration is the opportunity cost. You know, for example, when utilities simply do what the commission ordered and force fit a program design uh, to meet the TRC test, and you develop a middling level offer um, to what you know, Enya and um, um, David both alluded to in a different way. Um, so consider what happens. You probably develop a program that is not attractive and not customer centric. Um, that means not many customers will sign up. You build a whole organization, installers, call centers, marketing, supply chain, all fixed costs incurred, waiting for the customer to show up. So a better approach is to design, to design an offer that will work in your market, test it, um, work on both sides um, of the equation. By test it, I mean, you know, test it in the TRC and RIM test. And, and then, you know, take a longer term view. One last thing I'll say, parting shot, you know, it, over here. Um, our view is um, counterintuitive in a way that, you know, utilities should take programs like demand response and energy efficiency 
and use the opportunity to engage with the customer, improve customer satisfaction, and build a brand rather than simply comply with the commission order uh, to implement a demand response or energy efficiency program. Um, in fact, our experience has been that if the programs are properly designed and implemented, these programs not only achieve strong results, but actually improve customer satisfaction while improving uh, the brand. So anyway, I think uh, we have come to a point where it's 1 o'clock, and I think um, I'd like to um, certainly thank our panel, and I'd certainly like to thank uh, the audience for taking the time. Hopefully, um, you, um, it was productive. And uh, PJ, it's uh, over to you. Thank you, and thank you, speakers. Great presentation. For our audience, we hope you've enjoyed today's discussion. As you log off, please take a moment to complete our survey and give us your feedback so we can continue to provide you with quality content. Thank you for attending, and this does conclude today's presentation.